Hello, this is Sam Gerrans from samgerrans.com. Today is Tuesday, October 3rd, 2023, and today the subject is public opinion and mass communications. And uh, as per most Tuesdays, what I'm doing is looking through this book, which is called Propaganda, The Formation of Men's Attitudes by Jacques Ellul. And the reason why I'm doing it is because Ellul uh, sets out very well how propaganda works, what it's for, what the requirements for it are. Um, I'm not, as I say most weeks, inveighing against propaganda per se. I'm not inveighing against there being a ruling elite who form your mind, give you pretty much every opinion you've ever had and tell you that you're free. This to me is almost axiomatically true. It, it can only be this way because generally there are there are leaders and there are followers. This was always known through history. Uh, it wasn't a surprise to anybody. But as men get more and more delusional, if you look around, you go outside and take a little walk, you'll find that that is um, objectively the case. <coughs> They're given to believe that their opinions are something they've all come up with themselves. There are a few people for whom that is true, um, or at least to a greater extent. Uh, these are sort of outliers and weirdos. Uh, people who typically are um, uh, pretty unpopular. And, uh, get sh and and now what you see, of course, is that people who are pretty um, useful to the system, at least to a certain uh, extent, are then uh, retrospectively cancelled. I'm just thinking here of uh, Russell Brand, for example, or whoever it is, doesn't matter. And so, um, anyway... The reason why I'm using this book is because uh, Ilul was a, a social scientist, a political scientist, a very intelligent man. He was writing in 1964, I think it was published in 1965, so this was written on a, on a typewriter. And the reason why it's useful to me is because I can pretty much uh, cite him as an authority to explain how propaganda works. Now, I'm not looking for a large audience, I don't expect one. Um, what I do think and what I hope to achieve is to um, basically set for public record <coughs> the contents of this book, which people probably won't read anymore because I don't think a lot of people can read it. And anyway, it was written in a way that was really designed for his peers, for, for other intelligent academic men like himself. And so it would be considered elitist today and, you know, probably if there were any... Uh, monuments to Elul, they'd be hacked to the ground and um, Floyd George, or whatever his name was, uh, would be put up instead. But um, <clears throat> he was writing in a time where quality still existed, although in a deteriorating state. If you want to read a really good book that will expand upon this, I would suggest uh, Crisis of the Modern World by René Guénon. Um, and if you get through that, an even you know a good development from that is the uh, reign of quantity and sign of the times <coughs> excuse me i'm still ill by the same author anyway um some of this is going to be on youtube and the rest of it well all of it will be on my sub stack it's the only thing i ask for any support for or um but you know we know most people they they're not going to do that and that's fine but i want to get through this book when we're now up to page 99 um uh, if you like what you hear I recommend buying also his book, uh, Ilul's book, The Technological Society, uh, which really explains the time that you're living in and why, I mean, he doesn't say this, but to e extrapolate, expand upon what he does say, excuse me, <coughs> um, the idea of technique is, uh, really technique is modernity. It's everything post-electricity, um, plus the so-called enlightenment. Um, and what you might call a pragmatic approach. And the, the way it works is that everything is standardised. Now you're being, well, you have been standardised. Uh, your grandparents were standardised. every uh, Since really the, the rollout of radio, everybody's been in a process of standardisation. That's why it's almost nobody worth talking to left anymore. Anyway, going back to the to the to the technique thing, um, technique is is really a sort of rationalistic approach to things. So that, um, so you get the, the the word human resources. You're just a resource. So everything that your great 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 grandparents thought was important, you know, like race, religion, culture, history, blood, all those sorts of things. It doesn't matter where you're from. It's it's true all over the world. Uh, none of that counts anymore. 
uh, all that matters now is uh, ma material gain, speed, and efficiencies. <clears throat> and this is technique, or what Ilul calls technique. And the sad fact is that uh, any country which does not uh, does not embrace technique will be destroyed by those which do, and those which do embrace it will be destroyed by it itself. <clears throat> I'm not lamenting it, I'm not fighting against it, I'm not trying to stop it, I'm just explaining that the, it's like, like a water faucet, as the Americans call it. <clears throat> I'm just explaining how it works, that's all. A part of technique is propaganda, because living under technique is so abhorrent, it's so... Uh, unnatural that you would go insane if you were not susceptible to propaganda <clears throat> and those of us who are not susceptible or as susceptible to it uh, you know it's it's a it's a it's a it's a tough um, fight if you've experienced and uh, the modern parlance is you know waking up which is really to sort of look around you as you're on the cattle truck you know, on your way to the abattoir and realise that you're not going to a club 1830 holiday, no matter what the brochure said, <clears throat> um, you will have a really tough time. And a lot of people are sort of quote-unquote waking up uh, a bit late now, but, you know, should have been doing this 30, 40 years ago. The idea, of course, is that... Um, with the war in Ukraine, that, that Russia, and I happen to live in Russia, and my background's in Russian, as I tend to mention every week, I think. Um, I speak Russian, and I, I live in Russia. But the, the idea is that Russia and the West are in some sort of, locked in some sort of com mortal combat conflict, <coughs> leaving aside um, politics and you know conspiracies, if you want to call it that, and you know the Freemasons or whoever it is, um, just looking at the level of technique, the fact is that Russia and the Western are identical. Um, they are, have embraced technique entirely. And in fact, if you look at the war in Ukraine, I'm le leaving aside you know, what you think is happening there. The fact is that it's uh, an industrial war based entirely in technique. And if Russia had not embraced technique, it would have been completely annihilated. <coughs> um, but the, the, according to Ilul, and this is why I like to use Ilul, because he sort of means that I can, it doesn't have to be, you know, just Sam Gerens thinks this. Technique itself um, is going to destroy, and is destroying, in my experience, I look at Russians, uh, the Russian youth, uh, we call it maladyos, you know, the young people. Um, I'm not saying it's true of all young people, but a growing substantial portion of the young people of, the, of this of this country and i've lived here for 23 hours of the last 30 35 years <clears throat> are visibly delusional out of their minds um just like in the west perhaps not quite as degenerate and disgusting and filthy yet but they're certainly catching up quickly and so or, i'm not bemoaning this i'm just describing what's going on and, you know, the green hair and the, the hairy legs of the women and the Dr. Martin boots and the delusion and the sort of soy boys. We have all this here. And you get a lot of people now sort of talk about Russia as if it was, <clears throat> you know, some sort of bulwark against what they see happening in the West. Uh, I, I don't think it's in Russia's hands. Uh, I think people ascribe to the leadership of this country powers that they don't possess. Um, certainly they may be fighting a, a rear guard action against it, but this is unstoppable. You know, this is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You can't stop this. This isn't me being depressing. This is what Ilul says in, and wrote in the early 1960s. In fact, technique, I think, was the 1950s. Anyway, who cares about any of that? <clears throat> I'm going to read this. I'm going to stop off and give you some of my thoughts. It, it is a little bit terse, a little bit difficult, but we'll see how we go. So, page 99, opinion. We must add to all this the problem of public opinion. We have already said that, on the one hand, propaganda is no longer primarily a matter of opinion, and that, on the other, the existence of a public opinion is connected with the appearance of a mass society. We would like to stress here that opinion formed in primary groups or small groups has other characteristics than that which exists in large societies. <coughs> Excuse me. I know it's dull, but what he's saying is that uh, a good book to read would be 
The Crowd by Le, Le Bon. Um, it's not that I only cite Frenchmen, but there was a there were a lot of there were a lot of very bright Frenchmen who who, who wrote a lot of good books. Um, what he's really talking about is that if you think about the the the, the mass psychology. Let's take a football match, for example. The type of things that men will say and do in a crowd are different to those that they would do individually. So if you put one man, even watching his favourite football team, let's say Manchester United, just one man in a... In, let's say during the, the rollout of the, the COVID um, training wheels for the next leg of the uh, <coughs> tyranny... <coughs> They wouldn't let people into the stadia uh, during football matches. And so you had this r rather um, strange uh, phenomenon of, uh, uh, of you know, f Liverpool playing Manchester United to an empty, almost empty stadium. The way that individual, let's say you were able to sit alone in one of the, one of the seats and watch that game, the way you'd respond would be very different to the way you'd respond in a, as a group. That's what he's saying. Um, he, he develops this idea, which let's get to it. In small groups with direct contacts between individuals, interpersonal relations are the dominant relations. And the formation of public opinion depends on these direct contacts. Now, if you're under 35, you probably won't have experienced this. But what he's talking about is going back to the days when people actually used to not only talk to each other, but listen to each other and share opinions and experiences that weren't mediated uh, as you'll get into um, by uh, a, a, another force and so the village uh, tribe all of these things um, in those scenarios it's uh, propaganda in the sense that we mean it today isn't possible opinion in these is determined by what has properly be, been called the preponderant opinion which imposes itself automatically on the group as a whole so basically you know the the way things are done and so the way things are done it goes down as as, as, as sort of fine as, as the house you know that's not how we do things in our house or how it's done in the village um, <clears throat> tradition for want of a better word interpersonal relations lead to a dominant opinion because, first of all, leadership in such groups is recognised spontaneously. Now, of course, as, the, uh, as we experience, this is me now, the involution, as, uh, as Evola would call it, of the castes, you're not really allowed to talk about leadership, except in, in sort of very siloed uh, contexts. There is a kind of, um, you know, the leaders of tomorrow, uh, in what, what, what they call common purpose or something, pushing all this. But what they're not really talking about leadership, what, they, what they're talking about is a sort of monosodium glutamate um, orthodoxy and obedience. Um, they don't really mean leadership. They don't want leadership. In fact, if you look at the the kind of so-called leaders that you have in certainly in the West, with the exception of Orban, <coughs> what you have is a, a kind of a um, an expedited um, stupidity and um, conformity uh, of midwits um, competing for um, some sort of. Uh, place in the sun <clears throat> that's that's the extent of their leadership i'm i'm not i'm not complaining why would you have anything else uh, as as your culture is destroyed all cultures you get the leaders that best reflect you and because you are ignorant stupid solipsistic narcissistic and delusional those are the leaders that you are the, are the only leaders you could possibly relate to why would you have anything else and they're not really your leaders of course i mean you're actually owned but those are the those are the uh, the sort of um, the kind of window dressing that the the actual rulers, the people who control the money spigot, uh, give you, because you wouldn't be able to relate to anything else. It w they would be. I mean, if you had you know, a genuine leader, uh, Alexander the Great, you know, something like that, <laughs> you'd, you'd you'd be lost. Anyway, also group opinion is called on to regulate concrete situations or common experiences that bring into play the common interests of all the individuals in the group. Moreover, the social level of individuals in such groups is generally the same. 
if you look at it now, I mean, with the involution of the casts, uh, what you have, w w what we had was the um, basically the, the the kind of knightly cast uh, aristocracy rebelled against the priestly caste, <clears throat> and by destroying that, they destroyed themselves. And so you don't really have an aristocracy anymore. What you have is a, a kind of um, an expedited monosodium glutamated um, pleb caste uh, where people compete to be more ordinary than everybody else. And that's the only way in which they can really express any sort of excellence. Now, 150 years ago, this would have been uh, incomprehensible. Uh, but today this is the norm. And this is how societies destroy themselves. And this is... Uh, what I'm trying to say is that it's, it's not only an expression of propaganda in the mass society, <clears throat> it's a necessary stage in the collapse of the world society. Um, this might sound a bit depressing. Uh, I don't mean it in that way exactly, but this is what's going on. And as I can cite, again, the books of René Guénon, well worth reading if you want to understand this. Uh, Julius Evola, uh, Ilul, um, what I'm saying, there's nothing unique about it. A uh, good, another good person to read. I mean, he comes at it from a different position, but would be Ted Kaczynski. To continue, thus, such primary groups are spontaneously democratic. Uh, I don't know how Ilul is using the word democratic, but we've been trained to think as think of democracy as something good. Um, I, for me, it's the it's the um, the last death throes of civilization, because the people who are least qualified to have any understanding of how things actually work are the masses. And anyway, uh, because they're controlled by another um, power, their opinions aren't their own anyway. They're just basically a function of a ruling elite who are clever enough uh, and know how this works to give the the masses their opinion so-called opinions. I, 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 would, I would always put, you know, public opinion in quotation marks, air quotes. In fact, opinion is formed directly, for the individuals are directly in contact with the events that demand their participation. Right, so we're going back to the pre-electricity days, where there was basically not much in the way of propaganda, and you experienced things yourself, so you would have an opinion, and that would be based in reality. Once formed, this opinion is expressly is expressed directly and known to everybody. The leaders of the group know what the group opinion is and take it into consideration. They have contributed amply to its formation. But these groups are by no means liberal. Minorities within them appear as foreign bodies, for in a relationship such as this, opposition weakens into group communication so basically they were ethno ethnocentric religiocentric sociocentric uh, expelling the outsider and pertaining holding to a sort of common for want of a better word religion <coughs> sanctions are generally diffuse but energetic there is no equality that's going to be a almost a sacrilegious thing to say today there is no equality the members accept leadership and, of course, small groups also recognise instituted authorities. The father of the family, for example. Where's that today? Destroyed. Destroyed on purpose. Again, I'm not bemoaning this. I'm not arguing against it. I'm not fighting against it. I'm just describing how a water faucet works. Dominant personalities play a considerable role and often group opinion will be formed by individuals who are known to all members of the society and whose authority is accepted. OK, so let's just stop there. Uh, people hold up Athens as the because they, they had like this idea of de democracy, uh, which is really just a way of f flattering um, the lowest common denominator. And they'll say, well, you know, Athens, the Greeks were they believed in democracy. That's um, a, a very uh, particular way of presenting it. Um, they were citizens, men, not women, uh, who could talk to each other directly across a forum. Um, that that much is true. It, they, this wasn't what you, what you're told democracy is. 
to continue. Secondary or large societies obviously have a totally different character. Yeah, and going back to Athens, I mean, this was a city-state. This wasn't, let's say, America, a country of over 300 million people. <clears throat> um, and, of course, democracy is now uh, touted as, a, as a, a, an unalloyed good in all cases, that people with no education, no background, have never sat and really thought about things ever, who are distracted out of their minds, delusional, ignorant, stupid, solipsistic, um, which is, you know, the new citizen, that their opinion is really important, but not individually. Only when you throw, the, throw those opinions into a big box, mash them up, and come up with the supposedly, the, you know, the, the mean average. <clears throat> that that's a holy number. That, that gives you some sort of holy thing. Uh, the, ant the ancients would have laughed at this. They would have been aghast at this. Okay? So, to continue. In these societies, larger societies, generally the only ones considered by public opinion studies, individuals do not know and have no direct contact with each other. 1964, this was written. Moreover, they do not share the direct experience of problems on which they must make decisions. Interpersonal relations do not exist. Only overall relations, those of the individual with the group as a whole. To some extent, the opinion that prevails in such groups will be a majority opinion, which is not to say that public opinion is that of the majority. In such groups, the formation of public opinion is very complex and a host of theories exist on the subject. In any event, on the subject, in any event, public opinion has three characteristics. Here we are. <clears throat> it can shape itself only in a society in which institutionalized channels of information give the people the facts on which they will take a position. Thus, some steps intervene between fact and opinion. Right, I'll just break this down into English. It can only work when you've got a, an, an intermediary, a mass means of communication, a means of mass communication. That's the only way it can, it can operate. It's not um, Socrates arguing across the forum um, in Athens. It's, um, it's good morning Britain. It's... <coughs> You know, it's, it's uh, well, actually, it's, it's soap operas and so on. You know, th these, these are the things that give you your opinions. These opinions are required by, they're designed um, by men who understand how these things work, and it's not very complicated. Um, but if you haven't studied it, it will seem like sorcery. Well, it is a kind of, it is a form of sorcery. And those opinions are placed in your mind. Um, they're sort of like the moral payload. And these things are designed as social engineering. I, I'm I'm not claiming this as a um, as a sort of conspiracy theory, because this is how it works. I, I, if you're going to say, well, you know, he he made a chair out of wood. Well, that's a conspiracy. No, there are tools. You take wood. There are you know ways of using wood, ways of using tools. You know, if you cut it like this and, and make it a, a joint like that and and bind it like that and etc., you get a chair. This is how you form men's minds. It's just an applied science that isn't that complicated. Uh, as I've said in one of my former talks, previous talks, as it all mentions, the US uh, Army has manuals on this, just like it'll have manuals on how to, you know, how to take a gun apart and put it back together again. It's, it's the same sort of thing. Your mind is, can be put together like an airfix model. To continue, the information reaching the people is only indirect, but without it, there would be no opinion at all. See, <clears throat> you would, if, if the internet went down, the TV didn't work and all this, within a couple of months, you would actually have no opinions on any subject, except those that uh, came to you by the, the small groups which would then form, those groups would form around the old um, banners, as I say, of, of blood, race, etc. Uh, in, in, a, in a societal collapse um, before everything went back basically to the Stone Age. That's what would happen. 
Moreover, to the extent that we are dealing with information disseminated by intermediaries, opinion does not form itself by simple personal contact. And nowadays, opinion depends to a large extent on such intermediate channels of information. All right, what he's basically saying is it's the, it's the, 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 the channels of mass media which give you your opinion. And he was writing in the pre-internet day. Now, in the days when I grew up uh, in the UK, there were, I think, were only three to begin with TV channels. Um, BBC One, BBC Two and ITV. Later, uh, Channel Four came on. Today, you've got 100 million different channels on YouTube. Um, anyway, he gets to that sort of thing in a minute. A second characteristic of public opinion is that it cannot express itself directly, but only through channels. What he's saying is it doesn't matter who you talk to. It only matters if you have a platform. So to control the platform means to control the opinion. I'm not complaining about this. This is the point I have to keep making. I'm not complaining. I'm just explaining how it works. If you want my advice, my advice would be turn it all off. Um, you're going to die anyway, which is something which the medievals and the you know the uh, the men of antiquity all understood, and you know find scripture and you know lead a life of fear of God, um, because that's something that you can still you can still achieve. You can you can aim to be a healthy cell within. Uh, a leukemia ridden society which is which is dying that's the best you can you can hope for uh, it wouldn't be the first time in history uh, re read what um, well re read for example noah i would say that noah uh, noah's time is comparable to ours or perhaps the the time of lot <coughs> but if you find it difficult to exist in a society which is delusional and insane and evil well, that means that you're still relatively healthy. If you found it uh, to your liking to live in a society as evil and disgusting as this, that would mean there would, that there would be very little hope for you. To continue, a constituted public opinion is as yet nothing and does not express itself spontaneously. It will express itself in elections when electoral opinion and public opinion coincide through political parties associations in the newspapers, referenda, and so on. But all that is not enough. And anyway, I would add that those sorts of opinions are fairly well implanted, and they just give you... It's like toothpaste. You know, you go to a, a supermarket, and there appears to be this huge choice of toothpaste, but they're all produced by essentially two companies. They're all full of um, fluoride, which will basically turn you into a, a sort of a moron. <coughs> and... Um, and all of that. So the choice is apparent but not real. And again, I'm not complaining. You have a mind, you can use it. If you still do, if you still do, you can use it. The third characteristic of public opinion is that this opinion is formed by a very large number of people who cannot possibly experience the same fact in the same fashion, who judge it by different standards, speak a different language, and share neither the same culture nor the same social position. This was certainly true in the 1960s. I don't know if it's so true now because of the standardization of human beings. If you go outside and walk around, you'll find that there are, there are fewer and fewer men with whom it's actually worth talking, you know, having a conversation of any kind. Uh, anyway, you'd be fairly hard-pressed to have a conversation because people are um, almost like modern monks walking around engrossed... Uh, in their telephones, instead of instead of reading the Psalms or whatever it was. Normally, everything separates them. They really should not be able to form a public opinion, and yet they do. This is possible only when all these people are not really apprised of the facts, but only of abstract symbols. I believe it was Confucius who said that men are ruled by signs and symbols. What does that mean, symbols? I'll give you an example of a symbol. Um, democracy. People don't question it. They think it sounds. It's the idea that democracy is a good thing is, is an unquestioned idea. But what does democracy really mean? I, I, honestly, I don't know. Um, it seems to mean uh, a kind of mm, consensus of averages. If you question that then they've got some names to call you. 
Uh, so it, I don't know what it is. It, it's always changing. And it's uh, a chameleon. It's something which uh, can be used to justify things that people all think they know what it means. And it's, it's like uh, uh, under Obama, the, uh, that was quite a good piece of propaganda. Change, you know, change. What is change? It's, it's an abstraction. Well, democracy is an abstraction. And uh, means all kinds of different things to different people. Um, I, not only do I not believe in it, I don't believe we have it, and I don't think it's even desirable. Um, but, you know, who cares what I think? But only of abstract symbols that give the facts a shape in which they can serve as a base for public opinion. And I think that's this mean now why we get to things like, you know, Putin's unprovoked war of aggression. Does it mean anything? Is it based in actual fact? No, it's not based in any fact. But if you say it a lot of times, it becomes, it acquires a meaning. Um, or, I'm, I'm not here defending Putin exactly, but it's, as it's a country I live in, I know you know a lot about. Um, Putin's supposed to be an autocrat. Is this true? No, it's not true. Um, certainly Russia has a tradition of autocracy, if you want to use that term, which is what Russians you know, generally, historically, incline towards. We don't have the same unquestioning uh, allegiance to the you know the masses in this country or the opinion of the masses. We want, we tend to want in this country, a strong, capable leader, um, b because we know that throwing things open to the mob ends in chaos and death and we've experienced an awful lot of chaos and death in this society over you know hundreds and hundreds of years so it's not popular but is putin like an autocrat no he's a politician he has to be elected he is actually whether you believe me or not um He's, he's a moderate, um, and that's just the truth of it. <clears throat> but that won't be the, the opinion that you'll be given in the West. You, you know, Putin is the, the new Hitler. Everybody's Hitler who doesn't want, you know, whatever it is the West has been told to want. But it's, it's not true. <clears throat> but it is public opinion. Public opinion forms itself around attitudes and theoretical problems not clearly related to the actual situation, that's for sure. And the symbols most effective in the formation of public opinion are those most re remote from reality. I'll just say that again. And the symbols most effective in the formation of public opinions are those most remote from reality. In fact, I would argue that it's the inverse of reality. Uh, a new thing I've noticed in propaganda is what uh, has been termed projection which is, again, I'm going back to the, the war in Ukraine because it's, it's current and people you know, care about it. If you, if you ought to care about it, we're on the brink of... Well, we're actually in World War III. Um, recently, the American media machine has started saying that Russia, Russia is defeated in Ukraine. And, well, that's not true. <laughs> I, mean, I don't care if you believe me or not. It's actually the inverse of that. Um, I mean, tragically... Tragically, uh, about half a million Ukrainian men have been fed into the wood chipper of the of the Russian military machine, and are dead. And your propaganda machine has has supported that, and continues to. Therefore, public opinion always rests on problems that do not correspond to reality. Because he's such a boring writer, it's easy to just gloss over these. But I'll just read that again. Therefore, public opinion always rests on problems that do not correspond to reality. And most of this sentence is in italics. I think it was William J. Casey in 1974, who was the head of the CIA, who said, the time is coming when the American public, and by American he means world or public, uh, everything they believe will be a lie. And I think we're, we're there. We've been there for a long time. And if you know anything about how they're lying about current events. Just imagine how they lie lying about history. To continue, we have pointed out several times that the original small groups are obstacles to propaganda. <coughs> Excuse me. 
i.e. family, church, tribe, all those sorts of things. The opinion structure of these primary groups is opposed to action outside the group. Of course, we do not call the group's leaders action, actions propaganda, but this does not mean that the group members are free from propaganda. On the contrary, we have already noted that they are not. So, what he's saying is, is that even within smaller groups, there may be an element of what we call propaganda. <coughs> and again, Ilul is not, and not, neither am I, inveighing against propaganda per se. We're just explaining how, how it works. Because direct experience, immediate grasp of facts and problems, and personal acquaintance between individuals exists in the small group, Propaganda cannot function in such a group. Only in second-hand opinion can propaganda play its role. Okay, so it's only when it's mediated, media. In fact, it cannot fail to play it there. In order for public opinion to form itself in large groups, channels of information and manipulation of symbols must be available. Where public opinion exists... Propaganda crystallizes that opinion from the pre-conscious individual state to the conscious public state. Propaganda can function only in secondary groups in which secondary opinion can form itself. But we must remember that we cannot simply juxtapose those two types of groups because a whole society is composed of multiple groups. I'm just going to stop there. It's, if you think about it, Let's take the, what he's talking about, mediation. So now what you have online is people in chat rooms and forums and you know face group, Facebook groups or whatever it is, which are essentially echo chambers where they are in micro groups or relatively so. But what they can't see is that those groups themselves are mediated by um, large corporations and their opinions are guided i mean the, the, obviously the robots and trolls and all those sorts of things but also just algorithms you know what's going to show up in your youtube feed or in your facebook feed or whatever it is and so whoever controls that is shaping your mind um if you notice i've spent time buying books um it's not that books are necessarily free of propaganda but they do have the advantage that they're fixed Nobody's going to come back and, you know, take that book away from me and rewrite something and put it back. That's the first thing. And secondly, the books that I've bought um, almost almost entirely were written you know, before everything became as insane as it is now. It doesn't mean that everything's free of propaganda, but it does mean that uh, there's probably less of it. And the, the level to which those books are, uh, are, is a, are addressed is inordinately higher than what you're going to get now. If you look, I'm not complaining, but it's a fact. If you look at YouTube, I mean, my channel, I mean, I, I, sure, it's boring, I understand. Talk for too long, no pictures, it's, it's, it's understood. But um, the way that it works now is it's a race to the bottom. Again, I'm not complaining. It's just, you know, technique and propaganda form essentially an idiocracy. <coughs> it's under, you know, it's unavoidable. Um, the way I see it, that we're all in this race to the bottom and whoever gets their last wins. It's, that seems to be the way that it's going. And even the ruling, the rulers themselves, the people who put, you know, the Sunaks and the Boris Johnsons and the, you know, Bidens in, you know, in, in before you as apparent leaders, even those people themselves are, are becoming debased. They're not only uh, collapsing in terms of caste, they are... Um, devolving in terms of capabilities. Their only real capability is the ability to control money and uh, a technological elite. And it's a sort of Faustian idea where if we ignore the actual problems and the essence of things, that we can, by creating faster, th faster ways of producing more, i.e. quantity, uh, somehow elide or distract from the uh, problems of essence and reality. Uh, this is a, a false economy and is damned to defeat. 
I'm not saying that because I want to be that be, want it to be that way. Um, Ten thousand years of world history is on on my side, and so um, the way I see it, at least for what it's worth, the only way to go is to um, become a lone wolf, essentially, and. I'm not telling you which scripture to to follow. For myself, I follow the Quran. Um, what I call brand Islam is just another arm of government, as far as I can see, of the World Economic Forum. So I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about an a, an in individual engagement and applied exegesis. But as I have mentioned before, the New Testament, the Old Testament, the Bhagavad Gita, and I'm sure there are other uh, scriptures in whatever f um, sort of condition of uh, veracity that can be followed to advantage. Uh, but the people who do that, who choose to do that, and to hold to that, um, despite, you know, in the face of this tsunami of propaganda that that, that number of, of of men is going to is going to be reducing and also as we see there are going to be persecutions already it is normal um against anybody who isn't not only orthodox but malleable that's the main thing they want a kind of, you've got to be malleable to the new orthodoxy i noticed this just just as an aside Every time I go back or whenever I've been back to the UK, I haven't been back for about six, seven years now, but I noticed that the people that I see, they're, they're using vo new vocabulary now. Their opinions have been swapped out for a whole, well, not, not entirely new, but they've been moved down the conveyor belt. Um, they are, will, you know, they're embracing quietly, um, I think without noticing, the sodomite agenda, the paedophile agenda, um, the idea of themselves as essentially expendable, they may have some sort of residual resentment towards it, uh, towards uh, the culture being destroyed, their religion being destroyed, their background being destroyed, their race being destroyed, um, on the altar of this sort of new materialistic technique. But they usually don't express it, and if they feel it, they can't. You know, they can't really give full vent to it, or it expresses itself in ways which are very useful to the system, i.e., in you know, far right, ex what's called extremism, or whatever. I don't think they can uh, really grasp the fact that the conveyor belt is 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 going over the cliff, and I don't blame them. It's a very very hard thing to grasp, and you know. As it says in a film, which I really like some parts of, American Beauty, never underestimates the power of denial. To continue, propaganda can function only in secondary groups in which secondary opinion can form itself. But we must remember that we cannot simply juxtapose the two types of groups because the whole society is also composed of multiple groups. A conflict between primary and secondary opinions will arise. One will dominate the other. And this is why I go to why what we're living through now, in my opinion, is a, is a confluence where this problem is resolved by means of technology, i.e. algorithms. Propaganda can exist only in societies in which second-hand opinion definitely dominates primary opinion. Well, we're there now. Um, I mean, just for example, uh, as the late and very great Alan Watt, without an S, used to say, he said the time's coming when uh, women won't even know how to put a nappy or diaper on their own child. And that's where we are now. You know, women will, you know, if mothers, if, if, they're, if they're of a, a lower kind of background, they, you know, they'll, they're, they're encouraged to breed you see that they they can't they don't even know how to put a nappy on their own child they'll, they'll go to youtube to explain it to them and the latter is reduced and driven into a minority position and this is true of families now where the authority of the father well i mean obviously the legal system usurps the father but the mother too uh is the family is the parents are really just there to pay for the child's um, physical upkeep while the child is indoctrinated by the satanic system, essentially. 
Then, when the individual finds himself between the two conflicting types of opinion, he will normally grasp the general public opinion. And this is true, especially of women and beta males. They default to the consensus because their survival strategy is conformity. This corresponds to what we have said about mass society. Right, we're going to stop there for YouTube, etc. And the rest of this is going to be on Substack. Details of where I upload to, how you can join my Substack and Telegram channel. Support my work and download my books free are in the description. Thanks for listening and bye for now.